over the years, turbocharged aircraft engines with fuel injection systems have become very popular due to the increased performance they offer over naturally aspirated engines with carburetor fuel systems. It is very important, therefore, that you, the technical specialist, are familiar with the basic components of fuel injection and turbocharging systems. You should understand how each system functions, and most importantly, you must fully understand the dependency of one system on the other. To help you understand the fuel injection turbocharging systems used on Continental engines, Teledyne Continental Motors Aircraft Products Division presents Fuel Injection and Turbocharging Systems for Continental GTSIO 520 and TSIO 520 series aircraft engines. This training module will cover the Continental Continuous Flow Fuel Injection System and the Garrett Air Research Turbocharger System on the subject engines. Please note that this module does not include the Bendix Fuel Control Unit installed on the Beach Turbo and pressurized Baron. For information regarding this unit, refer to the Bendix Service Manual RSA 7DA1. Upon completion of this module, you will be better able to identify the components of the Continental Fuel Injection and the Garrett Air Research Turbocharging Systems and understand their functions. You will also be able to perform fuel injection and turbocharger adjustment, testing, inspection, and troubleshooting procedures. This information will help you to troubleshoot reported malfunctions and to complete the needed repairs in a minimum number of man-hours. This unit consists of this audio-visual presentation, a retention book, a mechanics workbook, and the program guide for this module. The retention book contains all of the information discussed in this presentation. The information is numbered to correspond to each frame. If you wish to review any of the material, simply refer to the corresponding frame number in the retention book. The retention book also contains the pictures. The mechanics workbook contains progress review exercises to help you check what you have learned during various parts of this module and the course completion exam which you may take at the end of this program. This module has been divided into four segments. Segment one covers two components of the fuel injection system, the fuel pump and metering unit. In segment two, we will look at two more components of the fuel injection system the fuel manifold and nozzles. This segment will also cover the major components of the turbocharger system. In segment three, we will look at inspection, adjustment, and testing procedures for both systems. And finally, in segment four, we will discuss troubleshooting procedures. At the end of each module segment, you'll be asked to stop and complete a progress review in your workbook. Now, let's get started. The fuel injection and turbocharger systems installed on Continental GTSIO and TSIO 520 engines have been improved since their introduction in general aviation aircraft in 1964. One of the most important things you should understand is how dependent the fuel injection and turbocharging systems are on each other. Before we can address the interaction of these systems, however, you should be thoroughly familiar with the components and function of each individual system. To begin, let's take a look at the Continental Continuous Flow Fuel Injection System. There are four basic components in the Continental Turbocharged Fuel Injection System. The engine-driven aneroid compensating fuel pump, the air throttle and fuel metering unit, the manifold valve, and the fuel nozzle. In this module segment, you'll have an opportunity to look at each component of the fuel injection system and study its function and design features. A good place to begin is with the engine-driven pump. The pump is of a positive displacement rotary sliding vane design and is driven by the engine through a mechanical coupling. Because the pump must deliver more fuel than the engine requires, a return path is added to recirculate the excess fuel. The pump must also provide adequate pressure for the fuel metering function. In the design shown here, the pump cannot provide the necessary pressure because pressure is lost as fuel travels through the return path. 
By adding a small restriction called a fixed orifice to the return line, the amount of fuel that can recirculate is reduced. This allows the pump to develop adequate pressure while maintaining an excess flow capability. This pressure plays an important role in the fuel pump metering function. Because the pump is driven by the engine, it will work harder at increased engine speeds. The orifice, however, remains fixed, so only a limited amount of fuel can recirculate. The increased pump action, therefore, results in higher output pressure at higher engine speeds. If for some reason the orifice in the return path becomes partially or completely restricted, outlet pressure will increase and fuel flow will exceed specifications. One problem with this pump system is that at idle speeds, the pump outlet pressure is too low to provide smooth engine operation. To correct this problem, an idle pressure relief valve is added downstream of the fixed orifice. This adjustable relief valve acts to further restrict fuel recirculation, allowing pump outlet pressure to increase. The adjustment of this valve is extremely important. If set too low, fuel pressure will be insufficient for proper metering at idle. If it is set too high, excessive pressure will develop during idle and mid-range engine speeds. Another problem that can develop in a fuel pump is fuel vapors entering the pump with the liquid fuel. This will cause erratic pump fuel flow and outlet pressure. Here, a vapor separator tower has been added to the fuel pump. Within the tower, vapor is separated from the fuel through a centrifugal action. The vapor then rises to the top of the chamber and only liquid fuel enters the pump veins. In order to remove the vapor from the tower, a venturi is added to the system. Fuel under pressure is routed through the small orifice of the venturi, creating a slight vacuum. This causes the fuel vapors to be drawn out of the separator tower. Fuel and vapor then flow through the return line and back to the aircraft fuel supply system. The airframe incorporates an electric auxiliary fuel pump for use during engine starting, vapor suppression, or in the unlikely event of an engine-driven fuel pump failure. Here you can see that a bypass valve has been added to the pump. This valve allows fuel to bypass the vein portion of the pump when the pump is at rest. Now let's look at a few more features of the fuel pump system. In this illustration, a high fuel pressure adjustment feature, aneroid bellows and housing have been added to the return path fixed orifice. In addition, a diaphragm and housing have been added to the idle pressure relief valve. Both housings are referenced to compressor deck pressure. The fuel pump pressure can now be adjusted at idle speed and also at maximum rated speed. By referencing the aneroid and diaphragm housings to compressor deck pressure, the fuel pump can sense the air pressure being generated by the turbocharger and react accordingly. As compressor deck pressure increases, the manifold pressure also increases. This increase in pressure will tend to close the idle pressure relief valve and the adjustable orifice, and fuel pump output will increase. The engine-driven fuel pump has now become a speed and pressure sensing component. This pump is capable of supplying the engine with the desired fuel pressures and flows for any given power setting. In summary, let's look at the design features incorporated into the engine-driven fuel pump assembly. High and low pressure adjustment. A fuel bypass system. Speed and pressure sensors. And a vapor separator. This component assembly becomes the heart of the continuous flow fuel injection system. Of course, as with any engine component, design changes are made to improve engine performance. In 1981, the GTSIO 520N engine model incorporated a new dual-stage fuel pump. Unlike the single-stage pump you have just looked at, the new pump is not equipped with a vapor separator or any unmetered fuel pressure adjustment features. These components are now located on the fuel metering unit, which will be discussed later.
Now, let's move on to the next components in the fuel injection system, the air throttle body and fuel metering unit. After we have discussed these components as installed on the TSIO 520 and pre-1981 engine models, we'll take a close look at the new GTSIO 520N fuel pump and metering unit. This illustration represents an air throttle. The air throttle is nothing more than a housing incorporating a butterfly valve mechanically linked to the throttle control lever in the cockpit. The air throttle is also mechanically linked to the fuel metering valve. This allows throttle movement to control both the fuel and air supply to the engine. Let's take a closer look at the fuel metering unit. Fuel enters the metering unit through an inlet filter screen. It then flows through a mixture valve that is connected to the mixture control in the cockpit. This illustration shows the mixture control in the idle cutoff position and fuel entering the metering unit flowing through the return line back to the engine-driven fuel pump. With the mixture control in the full rich position, all of the fuel entering the metering unit flows on to the fuel metering valve. With the mixture control in the lean position, the fuel flows to both the metering valve and to the engine-driven fuel pump. Now let's follow the fuel as it flows into the fuel metering valve. The metering valve illustrated here looks very similar to the mixture valve. Actually, both valves are of a rotary cam design, but vary somewhat in appearance. During full throttle operation, all of the fuel entering the metering valve is passed on to the manifold valve. Partial throttle causes the metering valve to restrict fuel flow. Remember, the fuel metering valve is linked directly to the air throttle and moves in direct proportion to the air throttle butterfly valve. This design feature allows the fuel-air mixture ratio to remain proper throughout the entire throttle range. An idle speed adjustment feature is provided to control the clearance between the butterfly valve and housing when the throttle is in the closed position. Turning the adjustment screw clockwise increases idle speed, and turning it counterclockwise decreases idle speed. The idle mixture setting is controlled by adjustment of the link rod shown here. Right-hand rotation or tightening of the nut enriches the mixture, and loosening the nut leans the mixture. In most installations, the metering unit incorporates a metering valve, mixture control valve, and an inlet filter screen. Both valves are of a contoured rotary cam design and meter the fuel before it is passed on to the manifold valve. The metering function is dependent on the mixture control and throttle lever positions. Before we go on and discuss the manifold valve, let's take a look at the new GTSIO 520N fuel pump and metering unit. This illustration represents the new dual-stage Lear Romec fuel injection pump. Looking at this cross-section of the pump, you can see that fuel pressure increases as fuel passes from the first to the second stage. The higher pressure fuel in the second stage is referenced to compressor deck air pressure through the use of an interstage pressure regulator. The pressure regulator is a diaphragm relief valve with fuel pressure on one side of the diaphragm balanced by upper deck pressure on the other. If fuel pressure within the second stage becomes greater than the upper deck air pressure, the diaphragm will move to the right and allow some fuel to flow back to the inlet side of the pump. In actual operation, the interstage regulator is always passing some fuel back to the pump inlet, but by referencing deck pressure to second stage fuel pressure, fuel delivery to the metering unit will be constant and much more precise. Here you see the new fuel metering unit designed to complement the dual stage pump. Remember, this unit is used only with the new dual stage pump. Fuel leaving the pump is routed past a fuel pressure switch, which controls boost pump operating pressure to the fuel metering unit. When fuel enters the metering unit, it first flows through a filter screen. Once past the filter, the fuel can flow to the left and to the right. 
When fuel flows to the left, as represented here by the color red, it will pass through the mixture valve to the metering valve and on to the manifold valve, just as in the metering unit you're already familiar with. When fuel flows to the right, as represented by the color orange in this schematic, it flows through the aneroid and low pressure relief valve. This fuel then joins fuel from the mixture return line and is routed back to the fuel tank. This differs from the old style pump where fuel routed through the aneroid and low pressure relief valves recirculated to the pump inlet. Although in this system the low and high unmetered adjustments have been relocated to the fuel metering unit, they function in the same manner as when they are components of the single stage pump. The low unmetered pressure adjustment can be used for setting pressure at idle speeds and the aneroid valve is used to adjust for correct fuel flow at takeoff or full power operation. Before we go on to segment two and look at the fuel manifold, take a break and complete progress review number one in your workbook. Now that you understand how the fuel pump and fuel control unit operate, let's look at the next major component of the fuel injection system, the manifold valve. Here is the manifold valve in its simplest form. The first function of this valve we will discuss is to provide positive fuel cutoff during engine shutdown. This illustration shows the valve in its cutoff position. Notice that a rubber diaphragm and spring have been added to the upper portion of the manifold valve. The diaphragm is attached to the top of the valve and creates two separate chambers. The spring serves to counteract the force of fuel pressure acting on the underside of the diaphragm. The lower chamber contains fuel under pressure from the metering unit and the upper chamber is vented to atmosphere. The cutoff valve is now shown in the full open position. Fuel entering the lower chamber under pressure pushes the diaphragm and attached valve upward. This action uncovers the entrance ports in the valve, permitting fuel to flow into the interior of the valve and then out the distributor ports to the nozzles. Placing the mixture control in the cutoff position will stop fuel flow to the manifold valve. The manifold valve closing spring will push the plunger down into its bore, sealing off the distributor ports and finally coming to rest against the cutoff seal at the top of the bore. This action creates a double seal and therefore a positive cutoff to the nozzles. Notice the atmospheric vent at the upper right. Each time the valve moves, this upper chamber must be able to breathe. If this vent should become obstructed, the valve will not operate properly. The vent must always be open and facing away from ram air entering the cowling. Up to now, we have shown the manifold valve either fully open or fully closed while performing its functions. This illustration shows the manifold valve at idle speed condition. The cutoff valve is just barely open and consequently is performing an undesirable fuel metering function by partially covering the outlet ports. Here you can see that a spring-loaded poppet valve has been added to the center of the cutoff valve. Now there are two valves the fuel pressure must open before fuel can flow through the manifold valve and out to the nozzle lines. The poppet valve will ensure that the cutoff valve is fully open during operation of the manifold valve. Let's take a closer look at this poppet valve. During engine starting conditions, fuel enters the diaphragm chamber and the cutoff valve begins to open. The poppet valve will remain closed until the cutoff valve is fully open. This illustration shows the cutoff valve just reaching the full open position. Notice that the poppet valve is still closed and this is just how it should be. Here you can see that the poppet valve has opened. This valve opens only enough to pass the amount of fuel being metered to the manifold valve. Also notice that the valve is fully open and not interfering with the fuel flow out of the distributor ports. At full power, 
the poppet valve is nearly fully open and the cutoff valve is fully open. In review, the cutoff valve opens first to the fullest extent of its travel. Next, the poppet valve will open, but only enough to pass the amount of fuel being metered to the manifold valve. If the poppet valve fails to open or behaves erratically, improper fuel flow will result. A new heated manifold valve is used on the GTSIO 520N and other later model engines. Heating the manifold valve prevents ice crystals from forming in the fuel when the aircraft is flying at high altitude. The fuel manifold is heated by running engine lube oil through a special finned chamber in the valve base. Oil flows from the forward end of the upper right oil gallery, passes through the valve chamber, and returns to the engine case through the timing hole plug. The oil outlet line case fitting contains a small orifice to slow the flow of oil through the manifold valve. This restriction, plus the insulation on the inlet and outlet oil lines, maximizes the heating effect to the valve. Other than this heating function, manifold operation is identical to earlier engine models. Regardless of engine model, manifold valves are calibrated according to flow. Here is a manifold valve with a letter M stamped on the top. This valve will flow up to one half gallon per hour more at a given metered fuel pressure than its counterpart, the P manifold valve. There are two basic functions of the manifold valve. The first function is positive fuel cutoff whenever the engine is shut down. The second function is simply to provide equal fuel distribution to all six nozzles. The basic components of the nozzle are a calibrated jet orifice, the nozzle body with its air bleed ports, and two O-rings. When the engine is operating, fuel flows from the manifold valve through stainless steel lines and enters the nozzle body inlet. As fuel passes through the calibrated jet orifice, it mixes with air supplied by the turbocharger through the bleed hole. The jet orifice size is closely controlled in order to assure that fuel flow to each cylinder is similar. This illustration shows the engine operating at idle speed with the manifold pressure at 20 inches of mercury and deck pressure at 29.92 inches of mercury. The fuel nozzle is a pressure reference nozzle because the bleed ports sense deck pressure. At idle speed, the airflow is high due to the large pressure differential. The air bleed feature assures good fuel vaporization at low speeds and prevents a high vacuum from developing in the nozzle lines. When the nozzle is operating under maximum power conditions, less air is mixing with the fuel due to the low manifold pressure and deck pressure differential. If the fuel nozzle was not referenced to deck pressure, the high manifold pressure shown here would flow back through the bleed holes and adversely affect the fuel flow to the cylinders. Let's take a moment to summarize fuel nozzle function. Nozzles meter fuel through a calibrated orifice jet. They mix fuel with air supplied by the turbocharger compressor and inject fuel into the cylinder head intake valve port where vaporization occurs. Contamination of either the fuel jet orifice or the air bleed holes in the nozzles will adversely affect engine operation. A restriction of the fuel jet orifice produces a lean fuel air ratio, and restriction of the air bleed holes results in rough low speed engine operation. That completes the explanation of the basic fundamentals relating to the four major components of the Continental Continuous Flow Fuel Injection System installed on turbocharged 520 series engines. But we also need to discuss the fuel flow indicator gauge and the exhaust gas temperature gauge. Let's start off with the fuel flow gauge installed in the aircraft cockpit. The pilot uses this instrument to monitor fuel consumption and for assistance in leaning the fuel system to specified consumption rates. This gauge is actually a pressure gauge that has been calibrated to indicate gallons per hour or pounds per hour flow.
The gauge is referenced to compressor deck pressure. This schematic shows how the aircraft fuel flow gauge is connected to the engine. The fuel pressure side of the gauge is connected to the fuel system at the manifold valve and senses metered fuel pressure. The air reference side of the gauge is connected to the induction system between the air throttle and the turbocharger compressor and senses compressor deck pressure. It is extremely important to understand that a leak in either the air or fuel reference line will provide inaccurate fuel flow gauge indications. A leak in the air reference line will produce a high fuel flow reading, and a leak in the fuel reference line will produce a low fuel flow reading. Many later model aircraft are equipped with electronic fuel flow gauges. These gauges replace the old-style pressure instrument and are extremely accurate when functioning properly. Now let's look at the exhaust gas temperature gauge, EGT, or engine analyzer, as it is sometimes called. This gauge measures the temperature of the cylinder exhaust gases. A probe installed in the collector manifold pipe senses the combined temperature of a selected number of cylinders. Probes may also be installed in the exhaust stacks of each individual cylinder to provide the capability to measure the exhaust gas temperatures of each separate cylinder. The exhaust gas temperature gauges and probes allow the pilot to monitor the temperature of gases entering the turbocharger. This equipment also provides the pilot with another instrument which can be used for fuel system management. Most turbocharged engines have a single probe installed at the turbocharger inlet or in the exhaust pipe near the turbine inlet. Multi-probe EGT monitoring systems provide the pilot with the capability to analyze certain cylinder combustion problems. A lean operating or misfiring cylinder can generally be identified by monitoring the exhaust gas temperature for that particular cylinder. Because of its analytical capability, the multi-probe EGT system is often referred to as an engine analyzer. Now that you understand how the fuel injection system operates, let's go on and discuss the turbocharger system. The turbocharger systems installed on the Continental 520 series engine are made up of four basic components. The single stage exhaust driven turbocharger, the wastegate valve and actuator, the variable absolute pressure controller, and the manifold pressure relief valve. The variable absolute pressure controller is the only turbocharger controller supplied by Teledyne Continental Motors and the only one discussed in this presentation. Refer to the appropriate airframe manufacturer's manuals for information on the operation and adjustment of other turbocharger controllers. Two additional components may be installed depending on the particular aircraft installation. These two components are a sonic venturi and an induction air intercooler. Let's look at each of these components and examine their function, beginning with the turbocharger itself. The basic components of the turbocharger are the compressor housing, the bearing section, the bearing seals, the compressor impeller that is attached to the turbine wheel with a common shaft, and the turbine housing. This drawing shows the turbocharger in operation. Exhaust gases from the engine combustion process are routed to the turbine housing by the exhaust manifold before being discharged. These hot exhaust gases passing through the turbine housing cause the turbine wheel to spin. The rotation of the turbine wheel drives the compressor wheel by means of a common shaft. As the engine speed and power increase, the exhaust gas flow also increases and compresses the inlet air to higher and higher pressures. This induction air pressure must be controlled and limited. So, an exhaust gas wastegate valve is added to the system. Opening this valve will allow exhaust gases to bypass the turbocharger turbine wheel, reducing its speed. Closing the valve routes more exhaust gas to the turbine, increasing turbine speed. The wastegate valve requires a control mechanism to modulate it. This mechanism is called a wastegate actuator and consists of a spring 
and hydraulically actuated piston. Spring force holds the wastegate valve open and hydraulic pressure attempts to overcome the spring tension and close the valve. Engine oil is used as the hydraulic source. Therefore, when the engine is not operating, the wastegate valve remains open. When the engine starts, oil under pressure from the engine-driven oil pump pushes against the hydraulic piston and compresses the spring. As the oil pressure moves the piston and its attached mechanical linkage, the wastegate valve moves toward the closed position. The wastegate valve may be either a poppet or a butterfly valve. The poppet type valve is mounted directly on the turbocharger housing and the butterfly valve is located on the turbocharger inlet diversion duct. Both the butterfly valve and the poppet valve are operated by the wastegate actuator. The controller that regulates oil pressure in the wastegate actuator is the variable absolute pressure controller. For information on the function of this controller, refer to the Continental Turbocharger Program number X3558. Here you see the manifold pressure relief valve, often called the overboost control valve. This valve is mounted in the induction system between the compressor and air throttle valve. This cutaway view of the relief valve shows the bellows and spring assembly enclosed in a housing. The bellows and spring hold a valve in a valve seat that is part of the mounting plant. The bellows is evacuated and sealed to provide a constant pressure on the plate, regardless of the operational altitude. Should the manifold pressure exceed a safe limit, the seat is forced open, allowing air to escape from the induction manifold. The valve will remain open until the manifold pressure drops within the maximum specified limits. Let's discuss two more turbocharger system components you should be familiar with. Here you see a sonic venturi. This venturi is used only in aircraft that are equipped with cabin pressurization systems. This calibrated orifice bleeds off compressor discharge air that is then used for cabin pressurization. This turbocharger component is the intercooler. It is designed to cool the compressor discharge air and is similar in design to an oil cooler or automotive radiator. As the engine ascends to altitude, the turbocharger must turn faster to compress the less dense air. This causes compressor discharge air temperature to increase and the density of the air entering the air throttle to decrease. To correct this problem, the intercooler is installed between the compressor outlet and the cylinders. The intercooler reduces the discharge air temperature, which increases the air density for any given manifold pressure. In most cases, the intercooler is installed on pressurized aircraft that are designed to operate at altitudes above 15,000 feet. The intercooler is needed at these higher altitudes to maintain engine-rated horsepower. Lubrication is supplied to the turbocharger and controllers through external oil lines connected into the left main oil gallery of the crankcase. Oil is returned to the engine through external lines connected to an engine-driven oil scavenge pump. From this brief discussion of the turbocharger system, you can see how the turbocharger, driven by exhaust gases, maintains sea level engine performance at high altitudes. The speed of the turbocharger is controlled by a wastegate valve, actuator, and a variable absolute pressure controller. An overboost pressure relief valve prevents manifold pressure from exceeding a safe level. The sonic venturi is used for cabin pressurization and the intercooler for improved engine performance at altitudes above 15,000 feet. Before we go on to segment three and discuss inspection and adjustment procedures for the turbocharger and fuel injection systems, let's take a moment to look at how these two systems interact. When the engine is at idle speed, the turbocharger is rotating but basically at rest. The small amount of air required under this condition enters around the compressor impeller wheel 
fast enough to maintain atmospheric pressure in the deck. When the throttle is opened, the turbocharger speed increases and the deck pressure rises rapidly. The operator manually controls the engine manifold pressure and exhaust gas flow by positioning the throttle. The fuel pump aneroid senses deck pressure changes and modifies the fuel pump output accordingly to provide the correct amount of fuel for smooth engine acceleration. It is important to remember that the fuel pump is a deck pressure sensing pump and not an altitude sensing pump. The aneroid compensates for deck pressure changes and not for altitude changes. Because the fuel injection system is referenced to deck pressure, the fuel injection and turbocharger systems are completely dependent on each other. Any malfunction of either system will adversely affect engine operation and may cause serious engine damage. Your understanding of system fundamentals and repair and inspection procedures is the key to safe, efficient fuel injection and turbocharger operation. Now, before you go on to segment three, take a break and complete progress review number two in your workbook.